debate Thank resumes. You. Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, Mr. President, I table for the information of the Senate a revised ministry list, and I seek to leave to have a document incorporated into Hansard and to make a short statement. Is leave granted. Leave is granted. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr. President. I advise the Senate that the updated ministry list reflects the updated ministry announced by the Prime Minister on 22 December 2020. In particular, uh, I congratulate Senator Sajolja, Senator Hume, uh, on their promotion to the ministry, and on to Senator Stoker on her appointment as an assistant minister. I thank the Senate. So we'll move to Senator Wong. Thank you. Uh, I also seek leave to make a statement relating to shadow ministerial arrangements. Leave granted. Leave is granted. Senator I thank I thank the Senate. On the 28th of January 2021, Mr. Albanese announced changes to the allocation of portfolios held by shadow ministers and assistant ministers. So I seek leave to table the revised shadow ministry list and to have it incorporated into Hansard. Leave granted. Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Keneally. Mr. Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Why is the Prime Minister cutting JobKeeper, cutting JobSeeker and cutting wages when his government has spent almost a billion dollars in advertising? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. President. Uh, well, Mr. President, it's disappointing to start the, uh, the new parliamentary year with a uh, question Order. that is, of course, uh, so full of misleading elements, uh, uh, so much trying to be the Labor Party Order. running a consistent Let's... approach to being a scare campaign yet again. The Labor Party that even on the matters of advertising doesn't seem to think that it's important for Australians to understand the support that's been available to them through the COVID-19 pandemic for them to have the health advice they need through the COVID-19 pandemic, for them to have the information they deserve through the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, Mr President, uh, there are a range of very sound, good reasons as to why the Australian public need and deserve information through this pandemic. Mr President, further, Order. the policy measures that our government Order. has put in place always set out always set out against the principles of being proportionate, targeted and temporary, and temporary have served Australia in a position to achieve, to achieve economic outcomes that are the envy of much of the rest of the world. In our country, in our country we've seen 800,000 jobs come back during the course of the pandemic from the initial collapse. In Australia, we should be proud of the fact that we have seen the effective unemployment rate, which peaked around 15 per cent, now Sorry. come back to a position where it is on par with the overall unemployment rate around 6.6 per cent. These, of course, are the achievements of having put in place policy responses that were effective, but also policy responses that are true to the principles we set out, that they would be temporary and targeted to the circumstances, and that we will continue to adapt and adjust to those circumstances, as we have successfully done at every stage of this global crisis. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. The latest figures show that there are more than eight people on unemployment payments for every job vacancy. Why won't the Prime Minister rule out cutting job seeker back to $40 a day? Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, uh, the support through JobKeeper and the Job Seeker Supplement have been important elements of our response today. But they're not the only elements of support to be able to continue to create more jobs and get more Australians back into work. We do see record levels of participation in the Australian employment market now. Remarkable situation, having faced a recession and a global pandemic, to have a circumstance now where the participation rate is at a record level demonstrating the high levels of confidence that have been established across the Australian economy in both consumers and in businesses. Now, there is still a job to be done. We don't deny that there is still very clearly a job to be done to continue to grow employment. That is why we continue support, be it our programs like Job Trainer, be it programs like Home Builder, be it subsidies for apprenticeships and traineeships, these are all important Order, initiatives. Senator Birmingham, time for the answers expired. Senator Keneally, a final Thank you, Mr. President. Question. How many of the 2.3 million small and family businesses in Australia and the 4.7 million jobs that they support are acceptable casualties of this government's decision to cut JobKeeper? 
in March. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, well, here we see the scare tactics from those opposite. Those opposite who I, who I note, Mr President, I note the Leader of the Opposition uh, was out there the other day uh, saying that uh, Mr Albanese, I believe today, Senator Abetz, uh, Mr Albanese today, the Leader of the Opposition was out there uh, somehow suggesting uh, that spending was too much. And yet we have others who come in here suggesting there should be more spending. The inconsistency from those opposite, of course, knows few boundaries. Now, these are incredibly trying times for many Australian businesses, as they are for businesses right around the world. In Australia, in Australia, we saw last year a decline in terms of business insolvencies relative to previous years. That was a function of the extraordinary levels of support and changes government had put in place. We've always acknowledged not every job and not every business could survive through a global pandemic, but the success of this country Order. in helping them Senator survive Birmingham, stands out from the rest the of the world. Has expired. Senators, I draw to your attention the presence in the gallery of the Ambassador of Switzerland to Australia, His Excellency Mr Pedro Zvarin. On behalf of all senators, I wish you a warm welcome to the parliament and in particular to the Senate. Senator McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Can the Minister update the Senate on how the Morrison government's economic recovery plan is working in 2021 to rebuild our economy, create jobs, and secure Australia's future in the wake of the global pandemic? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks very much, Mr. President. I thank Senator McLaughlin for his question, and I know his very strong advocacy uh, on behalf of so many businesses in South Australia, so many people across South Australia, as uh, my coalition colleagues do universally across Australia, in terms of support for jobs growth and economic success across the country. Relative to the rest of the world, Australia starts 2021 in a very strong economic position. There is much we can be thankful for as a nation. And our economic strength relative to other countries, particularly advanced economies, uh, is something to be incredibly thankful for. More than 90 per cent of the 1.3 million Australians who either lost their jobs or had their work hours reduced to zero during the peak of the pandemic are now back at work. Almost 800,000 jobs have been created in the past seven months. And pleasingly, Mr President, women have taken up the majority of these new jobs that have been created. As I referenced before, the participation rate of the, in the Australian workforce has reached a record 66.2 per cent, as my colleague Senator Cash has highlighted uh, this strength in the employment market, such a strong show of confidence. Quarterly growth has had its biggest increase since 1976, and consumer and business confidence are back to pre-pandemic levels. In the face of the biggest global economic shock of our lifetimes, Australia's economic comeback is strong. Our economic recovery plan is working. It has been supported by $251 billion in direct economic support to date, and Treasury analysis has demonstrated that this support is expected to result in economic activity being 5 per cent higher in 2020-21 than would have otherwise been the case, and 4.5 per cent higher in 2021-22 showing the ongoing effect, and that ongoing effect comes indeed through our tax reform changes as well, the ongoing support of the JobMaker hiring credit. These give continued support right across the Australian economy to the recovery. Order. Senator McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister outline to the Senate the Morrison government's priorities for the year ahead? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, the number one priority remains to suppress the virus and to successfully deliver the vaccine across Australia. Our government has outlined a $1.9 billion vaccine rollout strategy, which is on top of the $4.4 billion we have spent on vaccine purchases, medical research and, of course, support for our neighbouring countries. We are working closely with the states and territories, the Royal Australian College of General Practitioners, the Australian Medical Associations, large logistical companies, general practices and community pharmacies to make sure we have a highly effective and safe vaccine rollout. Vaccinations of Australians will commence in late February, pending approval from the Therapeutic Goods Administration the, to ensure an orderly rollout across priority groups first and foremost, and then working through the rest of the country. 
That, this is central to our ongoing support of the economic recovery, uh, to the delivery of essential services for Australians and to continuing to make sure we protect Order. Australia's Senator interests Birmingham. here Senator and around Blockwood, the world. Final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister outline how Australia's economic recovery compares to our international counterparts? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, the Australian economy is forecast to outperform all major advanced economies in 2020. Real GDP in 2020 is expected to fall by 2.5 per cent before growing by 4.5 per cent in 2021. This compares in 2020 to a fall of 7.5 per cent across the euro, euro area, 5.25 per cent in Japan and 3.25 per cent in the United States. In the June quarter last year, our GDP fell by 7 per cent, but this compared to falls of around 12 per cent in New Zealand, 14 per cent in France and 20 per cent in the United Kingdom. These stark figures are a reminder of the enormous challenges many other countries are facing as they deal with the health and economic crises that have been caused by the COVID-19 global pandemic. But in Australia, our AAA credit rating has been reaffirmed. We are seeing people getting back to work. We are seeing a recovery that bodes well for Australia's continued strength into the future. Senator Green. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Payne. Tourism operators in Cairns have warned the Morrison government that thousands of jobs will be lost if JobKeeper isn't extended. In January, Liberal MP Warren Ench told the Cairns Post, and I quote, I have got no doubt support will continue for as long as it needs to happen. And extending JobKeeper was, and I quote, a no-brainer. Is he right? The Minister representing the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and I uh, thank the Senator for her, uh, for her question. Uh, there is no doubt, uh, as the Senator has uh, alluded to, and as any of us who live in and visit uh, tourism-reliant uh, areas of Australia uh, know, that is when we can go from state to state, of course, Mr President, uh, that Tourism has taken a very significant impact from COVID-19, and former minister, Minister Birmingham particularly, has worked very hard with the industry uh, in terms of uh, response and support from government. And we have seen a boost to domestic tourism over summer, especially in those regions uh, within uh, driving or travel distance of, of major population centres. And those parts of the sector, though, Mr. President, that rely on international travel and tourism in particular, do continue to face very difficult circumstances. And so, from Minister Birmingham to Minister Tian, uh, the government has been engaging very closely with the tourism sector to understand how we are able to continue to assist uh, while we do wait for international tourism to return, and how we actively encourage Australians to engage in domestic tourism. Uh, we hope that. There will be some opportunity, for example, out of travel bubbles, uh, ultimately to, uh, to assist in that uh, international tourism to return. So it is a very challenging time, Mr President. There is no question about that. So through COVID-19, the government has provided record, record levels of economic support through programs such as JobKeeper, through small business cash payments of up to $100,000. And they have sustained hundreds of thousands of tourism businesses and jobs across Australia. As part of our plan to support tourism recovery, we're also providing further targeted assistance to help the tourism sector to rebound and to help save as many jobs as possible. That's in addition to our record funding for Tourism Australia of over $231 Order. million dollars in 2021. The answer has expired. Senator Green, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Treasury data shows that 3,600 businesses in Cairns are relying on JobKeeper more than any other postcode in Queensland. How many jobs will be lost in Cairns when JobKeeper ends in March? Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr President. I'll take the details of, uh, of the numbers uh, on notice uh, in terms of the Senator's question. I was saying, though, that we have provided record funding support for Tourism Australia that is being used to directly support the tourism industry, including ramping up that domestic marketing campaigns with phase two of the holiday here this year campaign, which is now underway, and of course positioning to commence international marketing campaigns when the time is right. We've outlined a clear plan for Australia to create jobs, to rebuild 
our economy, including helping to secure the future of, international to of Australia's tourism industry. That includes the provision of a $50 million recovery for regional tourism fund to boost tourism in nine regions heavily reliant on international tourism. That's about delivering tailored assistance measures to help tourism businesses pivot to the domestic market. Those applications are now open, with eligible applicants able to submit requests for funding until the end of September this year. We've also earmarked $100 million of funding from the Building Better Regions Order. Fund for Senator tourism Payne, infrastructure the under a new— expired. Senator Green, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Is the Morrison government working on any support plan for tourism businesses in Cairns? And how many more jobs and livelihoods will be lost in the region while people wait for Mr Morrison to finally take action? Senator Payne. Well, Mr President, I thank Senator Green for uh, her further supplementary question. Uh, I had already identified the Recovery for Regional Tourism Fund. I had just referred to the Building Better Regions Fund focused on tourism infrastructure, about helping the regions boost the supply of new quality tourism infrastructure to drive visitation in those regions. Also $100 million in the Regional Recovery Partnerships Program, coordinating that investment with other levels of government, state and territory and local government, to support growth and uh, recovery, including in tourism, in 10 priority regions. Also a $50 million business events program, a grants program, also open for applications, helping to instil confidence in the business events industry. That is also particularly important. And, Mr President, the uh, $128 million COVID-19 consumer travel support program that is providing, and this is important particularly for regions which have a high, level of, high number of travel agents, one-off grants to eligible travel agents, to tour arrangements, service Order. providers. Payne, All of those are focuses the of the government's plan. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the leader of the government representing the Prime Minister. US President Joe Biden has made climate action a priority. He's taken dramatic action against coal, oil, and gas companies, supported clean energy, and is preparing for a climate summit on the 22nd of April. He's spoken to many heads of state, both close allies and rivals, but he hasn't yet spoken to the Australian Prime Minister. Why hasn't this call happened? Is Mr Morrison way down the call list because he's a climate laggard? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, uh, thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, well, I, uh, I am certain of, uh, of one thing, and that is that, uh, that Pres President Biden won't be making his calls or scheduling his call list on the advice of Senator Hanson Young or the Australian Greens. Uh, what I do know is that the new U.S. administration, uh, who we congratulate upon their election and, uh, and, uh, and welcome the opportunity to work with them, uh, have already engaged deeply uh, with uh, building relationships across the Australian government. Uh, that, uh, that the uh, Secretary of State, and National Security Adviser, has uh, have each spoken with uh, with our Foreign Minister, Mr. Payne and that the Secretary of Defence has spoken with Senator Reynolds as our Defence Minister, and that indeed uh, uh, Mr. Kerry. Mr Kerry, uh, John Kerry, the uh, President Biden's climate envoy, uh, has spoken with Minister Taylor, uh, our Minister for Emissions Reduction. Uh, so indeed engagement has occurred there, and I have no doubt that discussions between President Biden and the Prime Minister will occur uh, in, uh, in short order, I am certain. But those discussions are occurring between our government and the new US administration, as you would expect, right across each of the portfolio levels. And I also reject categorically uh, the description of, uh, of laggard or whatever term it was that Senator Hanson used. Uh, the statistics show very clearly that you know, Australia's record in relation to emissions reduction stands well compared with the rest of the world. But between 2005 and 2020, Australia's emissions fell by nearly 17 per cent, by 16.6 per cent to be precise. This compares with an OECD average of emissions reduction of 9 per cent or a New Zealand emissions reduction of around 1 per cent, or Canada's emissions reduction of less than 1 per cent. These are the comparisons that show Australia's track record is strong, just as our intention to continue to drive the technological change that will deliver further Order. emissions Senator reduction Birmingham, is resolute. The answer has expired. Senator Hanson Young, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Well, I think we'd all be interested to know what uh, Climate Envoy John Kerry actually said to Minister Taylor because he's made his views about 
gas being a transition fuel very clear. Last week he said the problem with gas, and I'm quoting, is if we build out a huge infrastructure for gas now and continue to use it as a bridge fuel when we haven't really exhausted other possibilities, we're going to be stuck with stranded assets in 10, 20, 30 years. Will the Morrison government be trumpeting Order. their gas fire recovery in front the of the US Senator again? Senator Hanson Young, resume your seat. The ability to complete a question can be directly related to the length of the preamble. And if I call senators to order, I ask them to heed the chair. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, uh, thank you Mr. President. Uh, well, our government will stand by all of our energy policies that are about achieving secure, affordable, reliable order. energy for Australia, for Australian industry, for Australian manufacturers, while also meeting our commitments to emissions reduction targets. We also stand by the investments we're making in our stretch targets that are about the technologies necessary to achieve emissions reduction in the future. Our targets investing in getting clean hydrogen to under $2 per kilo, in getting electricity from storage for firming to under $100 per megawatt hour, from getting low emission steel production under $900 per tonne and low emissions aluminium under $2,700 per tonne from getting carbon capture and storage under $20 per tonne of CO2, getting soil carbon measurement under $3 per hectare per year book. These are all about how you actually achieve emissions reduction rather than just grandstand on it, Senator Hanson-Young, and that's where we're focusing Order, the investment and the energy. Senator Hanson-Young, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Will the Morrison government be taking a more ambitious plan to this summit in April? In fact, will you even be invited? Will you be invited and will you continue to isolate Australia on the world stage in the eyes of everybody else who wants real action on climate change and now the US are making us look like we are laggards left for dead and what are you going to do about it? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thank, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, well, uh, uh, you know, we're starting the year with, uh, with lies and misleading statements in Labor questions, and of course, uh, and of course, lots of uh, hysteria from uh, from the Australian Greens. The facts of the matter, the facts of the matter, Mr. President, the facts of the matter are uh, that our government looks forward to working with the Biden administration. We've already had outreach on a number of levels, including between the Minister for Emissions Reduction and the climate change envoy. We particularly look forward to the fact that President Biden, during his campaign, emphasised the importance of investment in transformative technologies. Because as we have identified, you don't achieve emissions reduction outcomes without those transformative technologies. It's transformative technologies that have driven the remarkable take-up of renewable energy in Australia, and it's transformative technologies that will achieve change elsewhere, including in other countries around the world, who we need to see achieve emissions reductions as well if the world is to Order, successfully Senator tackle Birmingham. this issue together. Senator Dean Smith. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Will the Minister update the Senate on developments in Myanmar. The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Smith for his question and for his long interest uh, in matters concerning uh, Myanmar. The Australian government is, I have, as I have uh, stated in uh, a statement yesterday, deeply concerned that the Myanmar military, the Tatmadaw, has uh, seized control of Myanmar. Early on the 1st of February, the Tatmadaw detained democratically elected leaders, including State Councillor Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, the President uh, and others. The Tatmadaw has announced a state of emergency and the establishment of a caretaker government, with the military appointed vice president uh, currently appointed caretaker president. Uh, he has handed authority to the commander in chief uh, for one year. Mr President, the situation does remain fluid. Uh, communications, including both phones and internet, in the capital Naypyidaw in the city of Yangon are severely disrupted. Uh, the Tatmadaw are demanding uh, revision of the November 2020 election results and have announced they intend to hold new elections. Note for the record that Australia was part of uh, international observer participation through our uh, post in Yangon uh, to those elections. Uh, in the statement I released yesterday, we did call on the military to respect the rule of law, 
to resolve disputes according to lawful mechanisms and to release immediately all civilian leaders who had been detained unlawfully. The Australian government has called for the peaceful reconvening of the National Assembly of Myanmar, consistent with the results of that November 2020 general election. Our embassy in Yangon is making inquiries regarding the safety and position of Australians to the extent that disrupted communications uh, allow. These, are, these events are particularly concerning because the political stability of ASEAN member states is essential to achieving a secure, peaceful region, prosperous and open Indo-Pacific. ASEAN, of course, is at the centre of our vision for the Indo-Pacific region. Senator Smith, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Will the minister advise on Australia's engagement with other nations that share our concerns about these developments? Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr. President. Thanks, Senator Smith. Uh, we are in close contact with uh, other countries, including through our embassy in Yangon, uh, to discuss these developments and our respective responses. Uh, Like-minded democracies around the world have expressed uh, that they share uh, our deep concern. We welcome statements by regional partners and other governments, uh, including ASEAN Chair Brunei. I spoke with Dato Erwan, my counterpart uh, in Brunei today, just before question time. Uh, from Malaysia, from Singapore, from Indonesia, the United States, the UK, Japan, Canada and others. I've also spoken today, as the uh, government leader in the Senate alluded to, with United States National Security Adviser Jake Sullivan and uh, raised uh, these issues in that discussion, and I will uh, continue to raise them with other colleagues. Last week, on the 29th of January, we signed a joint statement affirming our support for Myanmar's democratic transition, urging the military to adhere to democratic norms with a number of like-minded uh, countries represented in Yangon. We will continue to work through our overseas network to engage Order, with other Senator governments, Payne. particularly in our region. Senator Smith, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Will the minister ad uh, advise the Senate on Australia's strong commitment to supporting democracy in Myanmar? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And Australia has been a long-standing partner for Myanmar through both good times and more difficult periods. We have consistently supported the move to democracy, that transition period, and the social and economic reform agenda. I visited Myanmar shortly after my appointment as Foreign Minister in December of 2018. I know Senator Smith has visited uh, on previous occasions as well. Our development program there includes a focus on promoting peace and stability. Uh, on democratic institutions, on supporting elections, uh, on the peace process and women's empowerment and gender equality. Our commitment to Myanmar's development and Myanmar's people continues at that, this difficult time and includes support for vaccine access, for delivering humanitarian assistance and supporting inclusive social and economic development. We sincerely hope to see Myanmar succeed for the benefit of all of its people and for our region as a whole. And I do want to assure the people of Myanmar, the many members in the diaspora here in Australia, Order. that Senator we will Payne, stand with them in this difficult the time. Expired. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. On the 7th of September, Mr Morrison promised, and I quote, Australians will be among the first in the world to receive a COVID-19 vaccine. With 60 countries having commenced vaccinations and more than 100 million doses of the vaccine already given, how can the Morrison government claim it has delivered on this promise? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. <laughs> Thank you, Mr President. Thanks, Senator, for the question. Mr President, what this government do, is doing is what we said we'd do, which is manage an orderly rollout of vaccine, Mr. President, and, and managing the vaccine rollout, Mr. President, uh, with a fully with Order. a fully approved vaccine starting very soon with the arrival of the Pfizer product after the TGA approved the 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 vaccine for uh, from Pfizer, uh, and we will continue to manage that orderly rollout, Mr President. I have to say it's really disappointing. It's really disappointing, Mr President, that the Labor Party continues with their reckless, completely reckless commentary with respect to vaccine, Mr President. We have, we have at all times, Mr President, managed an orderly process through accessing appropriate an appropriate Order. number of vaccine candidates, going through an appropriate and full vaccine, uh, approval process to ensure that Australians can have confidence in the vaccine that we are, vaccines that we are looking to provide to uh, Australians. The, the confidence that Australians have 
in, this vaccine, in the vaccines that we have available is going to be absolutely crucial to take up of vaccines across the country and to the protection of Australians, particularly those, Mr. President, who are most vulnerable. So, Mr. President, we will continue our orderly and structured process for the provision, approval, and application of vaccines uh, that we we have started, and we have continued to be honest with the Australian people with respect to the rollout, the availability of vaccines, and we've brought them on responsibly, not like the Labor Party, who have continued with this reckless, reckless commentary which will only Order, undermine Senator confidence Colbeck. in the Senator, vaccination Order, process. Senator Colbeck, time's expired. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Yes, I do have a supplementary. Thank you, Mr President. On the 5th of November, Mr Morrison declared that Australians would be, and I quote, at the front of the queue. Can the minister confirm approximately 60 countries are in front of Australia? So which queue was Mr Morrison referring to? Senator Colbeck. Mr President, uh, I will repeat what I've just said with respect to rollout of the vaccine. Mr President, we will continue to roll out the vaccine in a responsible manner uh, with a fully approved process. The TGA has, has undergone a comprehensive order. Senator, approval Senator process Colbeck. for the vaccine to Wong ensure— order, Senator Colbeck. Senator Wong on a point of order. Point of order is direct relevance. Uh, the minister was asked a question, a very short question, uh, which included the Prime Minister's assertion to the country that Australians were at the front of the queue. Uh, we would invite the minister to respond to the question, which is which queue was the Prime Minister referring to? I'm listening carefully to the minister's answer. I, I can't instruct the minister either on the part of the question or the terms in which he may answer. However, it was a relatively narrow question. I'm going to consider the minister to be directly relevant if he strictly confines his comments to the distribution or rollout, for lack of a better term, um, of the vaccine. But I'm listening carefully to his answer. Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, uh, we will continue to roll this, the vaccine out in accordance with approval by the Therapeutic Goods Administration, which is the responsible thing for us to do, properly certified and approved by the TGA, which is exactly what we're doing. We are one of the first countries in the world to be able to provide a fully approved Order. vaccination process for Australians. And we will continue to do that because one of the most important things, Mr. President, one of the most important things is that Australians have confidence in the vaccine that we are offering to them. Order. And the take Senator up Colbeck, of the vaccine. Time for the, answer, time for the answer has expired. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. In the UK, US, Canada, and the EU, the time between approval and the first doses being administered was between three and six days. The TGA approved the Pfizer vaccine eight days ago. How many more days will Australians have to wait? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the, the Pfizer vaccine is being provided to Australia in accordance with the contractual arrangements that we signed with Pfizer for the take up of the vaccine. And under those arrangements, shipment of the vaccine was conditional on our approval of the vaccine. So we are receiving the vaccine in accordance with the contractual arrangements that were made with the manufacturers of the virus. When the virus arrives in this country, it will be batch tested to ensure that it uh, meets the requirements that it's specified to have, and then it will be made available to Australians. Mr. President, I am not going to to descend into the irresponsible, Order. irresponsible and reckless, Order. reckless commentary that the Labor Party are trying to engage in, because confidence in this order. vaccine Colbeck, is absolutely vital. I have Senator vital. Wong on a point of order. Senator Wong. Senator Wong on a point of order. Point of order direct relevance. He's worried about confidence in the vaccine. I assume he's going to reject order. Mr Kelly's Senator arguments Wong. Uh, order. publicly. Senator Wong, that's not a point of order. My point of order is direct relevance. Delay between approval and administration. Thank you, Senator Wong. On the point of order, 
I have ruled before that when there are strictly drafted questions, and I do consider this one to be one without pejorative phrases, um, political observations on the opposition are not directly relevant. Um, now, Senator Colbeck, you only have two seconds remaining. I'll ask you to continue. Senator Colbeck. Mr President, as I said, the vaccine is being provided strictly in Order, terms Senator of the Colbeck, contractual time right. for the answer has expired. Senator Chandler. Order. Order. Senator Ch Order on my left. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr President. And it is an honour to ask this question to the Minister for Superannuation, Financial Services and the Digital Economy, Senator Hume. Can the minister inform the Senate why the Morrison government is modernising Order. and improving? Order. Order on my left. Order. Senator Ayres, you're not being helpful. It is only our first day back. Order. Just for something different. Senator. Start again. Senator, I'm not sure. I think we heard the question, didn't we? No, Senator. We. All right. Senator Chandler, if we waste time, we are costing the opposition time. Senator Chandler. Order on my left. Order. <coughs> Senator Chandler, I, we, we are going to continue to waste time that is traditionally considered to be of value to non-government parties if I don't have silence for a colleague to, answer, to ask a question. It is our first day back. Can we try a little harder? Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister inform the Senate why the Morrison government is modernising and Order. improving? Order, the... Senator Chandler. We... I'm, gonna... I'm happy to do this till three o'clock. I'm happy to. It's not particularly, you know, it's not particularly of concern to me how I spend the next 23 minutes. Senator Birmingham. Mr. Mr. President, since you called for order, Senator Wong hasn't ceased speaking. She's order. Oh, now, the opposition have had their bit of fun. Yeah. Uh, if perhaps all interjections are disorderly, as you've rightly pointed out, you grant a degree of tolerance, Mr. President, but I think the tolerance is being stretched now. Um, I, I, don't want, I, I don't particularly want to commence the first day back by actually asking, threatening to name anyone. But this is a question time, not a session of Gregorian chanting. So I would ask that Senator Chandler, after the opposition has made its point and will have time to do so at three o'clock when we take note of answers, we hear Senator Chandler and her question in silence. Please. Third Senator time Chandler. lucky. Can the minister inform the Senate why the Morrison government is modernising and improving Australia's superannuation system? Minister for Superannuation, Financial Services and the Digital Economy, Senator Hume. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Chandler for her question Order. and her ongoing commitment to a more efficient, a more cost-effective superannuation system in Australia. Mr President, the Australian superannuation system manages around $3 trillion in retirement savings on behalf of around 16 million Australians. And while the system has grown significantly, it does need to adapt to better meet the needs Order. of Australians. The Your Future, Your Super package announced in the 2020-21 budget is the Morrison government's next step in modernising and improving the Australian superannuation system to ensure that it is working harder for all Australians. This is part of the government's plan to make the Australian super system more competitive, more transparent, more efficient and better governed and ensure that Australians can reap the full benefits of compulsory superannuation. Mr President, the Treasury forecasts that your future, your super package will save Australians around $17.9 billion over the next decade in reduced fees and better performance of the super system. Young Australians entering the workforce could be up to $98,000 better off at retirement because of these reforms. Yeah, yeah. At, present, 
Uh, at present, Australian households pay around $30 billion a year in superannuation fees, and that excludes insurance premiums. That's more than the $27 billion that households spend on energy bills and the $12 billion they pay on water bills. This government's measures to date have gone a long way to combating the inefficiencies and, and anomalies, but more must still be done. And, Mr. President, the question must be asked. Will Labor again oppose the legislation that will make Australia's system more competitive, transparent and efficient? Senator Chandler, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister advise the Senate— Order. I, I really don't want to feel like I'm in a classroom. I know there are people in here with a lot more experience than I am in that, in that um, as teachers I was referring to. I, we don't need chanting, quite frankly. The point has been made. It's not particularly amplifying, Senator Keneally, because I can't hear Senator Chandler clearly, and I would like to. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister advise the Senate how Australians will benefit from an improved superannuation system? Thank you, Senator Chandler. Senator Mr. President, Mr. President, announced uh, the uh, the reforms announced in the 2021 budget, the Your Future, Your Super package will create efficiencies, reduce costs, and reduce duplication through four measures. First, through ensuring that superannuation follows you when you change jobs. This will stop the creation of unwanted multiple accounts that reduce retirement savings through duplicate fees and insurance premiums. Second, by introducing a new and interactive online Your Super comparison tool. And this will empower members to make better decisions about who manages their retirement savings. The Your Super tool will help members compare and select My Super products that best meet their needs. Third, through holding funds to account for underperformance by introducing an objective performance test, and funds that fail that test will be required to inform their members, and if they fail in two consecutive years, they will be stopped from taking new members. And finally, by increasing transparency and accountability, ensuring trustees act in the best financial interest of members to maximise their retirement time savings. The answer has expired. I'm going to ask senators on my left to restrain themselves. On the first day back, special, special effort. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister outline the importance of a superannuation system that holds funds to account for underperformance? Senator Hume. Mr. President, this government has steadily raised the bar on superannuation performance expectations and governance structures since we came to power. Our focus has squarely been on ensuring superannuation delivers for members, for consumers, for everyday Australians. The Your Future, Your Super package will protect members from poor outcomes and encourage funds to lower their costs. The Morrison, go the Morrison government wants and indeed it expects superannuation will deliver more for Australians. The Your Future, Your Super reforms will do just that. It's not, uh, it wasn't until we, on this side of the chamber, came to government that super, the superannuation system had a light shone on underperformance and inefficiencies. We know this because our changes to the super system uh, to make it more competitive, transparent and efficient have had great effect. 800,000 Australians who were locked Order into a fund by their employers now have the, your, the, the choice Order. to choose their own fund. $760 million was paid to 700,000 employees through our amnesty measures and $3.7 billion Order. in unintended Senator accounts Hume. have Time been for consolidated. The answer has expired, Senator Hume. Order. Senator Lambie. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is for the Minister for Finance, Minister Birmingham. Minister, uh, Mr Kelliston used, used to be responsible for policing our donations laws when he was Commissioner of the Australian Electoral Commission. He told the ABC yesterday that our political donation laws are some of the worst in the world. He said the rules do very little to make sure voters know who is funding political parties and how much donors are giving of any out there. You'd think he would, he would know how bad things are. Is he wrong? Minister for Finance, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Thanks, Senator Lambie, uh, for her question. Um, I don't agree with the assessments that, uh, that have been made. Yesterday, we saw the disclosure of donations across the Australian political landscape, and they provide uh, a high level of transparency around uh, major donations that are made directly to uh, political parties, uh, and, uh, and in doing so, uh, serve to give and should give the Australian people and public confidence uh, around that donation system. Senator Lambie, a supplementary question. 
Thank you, um, Mr. President. Minister, it was only yesterday that Australians found out about money that could have gone into the Coalition's bank accounts over 19 months ago. Do you believe that voters think that delay passes the pub test? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. President. Uh, well, I know that, uh, that many things exercised the minds of, uh, of many voters, and we've canvassed some of those during question time today. I think, first and foremost, at this time, uh, health and employment considerations exercise uh, the minds of voters. Uh, but, uh, but in relation to uh, political donations, uh, we have a system uh, where they are reported both by uh, the donor under, uh, under certain requirements and by the recipient under certain requirements. Uh, it's an important check and balance, uh, and yesterday was an example of how it works. Senator Lambie, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. When money changes hands between political parties and political donors in Queensland, Queenslanders hear about it in seven days. Voters find out about political donations in 21 days during an election in New South Wales in Victoria, but federal political parties can drag their heels for more than a year before they have to tell voters about where their money has come from. Why are the, ex why are the expectations for political parties so much lower in federal parliament than they are in every other state except for Tasmania? Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, the, uh, the arrangements that are in place and they've been uh, reformed occasionally over the years in different ways, but they are arrangements that do provide uh, for uh, the publication of details. So you can see across uh, today's media that, uh, that there is uh, scrutiny given to that. Uh, all members of, uh, of political parties uh, are aware uh, that such donations will be published. Uh, the donors who make those donations are aware that they will be published, uh, and in doing so, as I say, that gives uh, transparency across the system uh, and, uh, and ensures that our democracy, which does, uh, is a free democracy in which people are free uh, to engage, including to give money uh, as part of that, uh, part of that process. And, uh, and if there are any areas where there might be argu arguably a lack of transparency, it's probably in relation to some of those non-political party entities, those like GetUp or others. Uh, who, uh, who, uh, whose funding Order, sources Senator are Birmingham, more opaque. Time for the answer has expired. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. And my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. The Liberal member for Hughes, Mr. Craig Kelly, has made a range of statements, including, and I quote, "You don't need no vaccine." Does the minister agree this statement? is irresponsible and dangerous and endangers Australian lives. The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, well, I, gather, uh, I understand Mr Kelly has, uh, has equally indicated that, uh, uh, that he supports the distribution of the vaccine, intends to have a vaccine himself. Uh, now, my message to all Australians and the message of our government to all Australians is whether you are a member of the public or a member of parliament, you ought to take your health advice uh, from the health experts yeah, yeah. when it comes to uh, the development of our vaccine strategy. Our government works alongside uh, Professor Paul Kelly, uh, the chief medical officer in the development order. of our vaccination Senator strategy. Birmingham, I have Senator Wong on a point of order. Senator Wong. The point of order is not whether or not the Prime Minister is listening to the advice of the medical officers. Uh, the point of order is direct relevance. The question is not about whether the Prime Minister is listening to the advice of medical officers. We are asking this minister, who is representing the Prime Minister, that whether or not the statement by Mr Kelly that you don't need no vaccine end quote, is irresponsible and dangerous. Thank you, Senator Wong. Um, the minister earlier in his answer did reference statements by the member of the other place, uh, and he is specifically talking about uh, communications and information about a vaccine. I've allowed you to restate the question. I can't instruct him how to answer it, but as long as he stays on those bounds, I think he is being directly relevant. Senator Birmingham. Thank, thanks, Mr President. Let me be, be very clear. Let me be very clear. All Australians are encouraged and should be encouraged to receive a vaccine. The vaccine, the vaccine Order is voluntary, Order. and the rollout of the vaccination process will be voluntary. Order. However, Order. all members across the parliament, all people across leadership positions, ought to encourage the safe receipt of the vaccines. 
because, order. because, Mr. President, we are doing this based upon the health advice, the best order. available health advice for the nation. As Senator Colbeck outlined to the chamber before, Australia is one of the few Senator countries Wong in the world. On a, on a point of order. Point of order, direct relevance. The question is about a statement made by Mr Kelly. Will this minister say to the Senate and through it the Australian people that Mr Kelly's statement is irresponsible and dangerous? Uh, again, Senator that Wong. is the question that he has been asked. Senator he is refusing to even respond to Mr Kelly's Senator, statement. Senator Wong, I have allowed you to restate the question. I have ruled previously and I believe the minister is narrowly constructing his remarks. You are asking me to instruct the minister the terms in which he should answer, which is outside my authority. There's a chance to debate answers after question time. I believe the minister is being directly relevant. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Thanks Mr President. Again, as I have said very clearly, everyone should be encouraged to have the vaccine and everyone should encourage receipt Order. of the vaccine. And in this Order place and in the there. other place. Everyone Order. should encourage their constituents and others to receive a vaccine, a vaccine that in this country has Senator gone Gallagher. through more scrutiny, safer processes and will be part of a coordinated vaccination strategy for which all Australians should Senator have confidence Keneally. in its safety and its efficacy. Senator O'Neill, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Yesterday at the National Press Club, like you did just now, Senator Birmingham, again refused to reject Mr Kelly's irresponsible and damaging comments. Why? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr President, I don't think I could have been any clearer in relation to the government's position Order. or my position about the receipt of vaccines. We encourage everyone to receive a vaccine. It is voluntary across Australia and will be voluntary. But we want to make sure there are high levels of confidence in the vaccine program. We have gone through a process that is thorough and rigorous to ensure those high levels of confidence. Australia, unlike other countries that have had to rush emergency approvals, has been able to go through the comprehensive processes of the Therapeutic Goods Administration. Australia, unlike other countries that have had to rush distribution processes, has been able to develop distribution arrangements that should give people confidence in the efficacy and efficiency of the rollout. Australia is taking a role leading not only in our country but in others Order. in our Senator region to promote Senator the receipt on a, Senator, of the Senator vaccines. Birmingham, Senator Birmingham, sorry, Senator O'Neill, uh, on a point of order. Uh, the point of order again is relevance. The question was very clear. Why do you continue to refuse to reject Mr Kelly's irresponsible uh, comments? Uh, Senator O'Neill, uh, again, I, I can't instruct the minister of terms in which to answer. I believe the minister is constructing his comments and is direct, to be directly relevant um, and has addressed part of that question in his answer. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, I'm not going to give airtime to debates about the merits of the vaccines. I'm going to stick to the merits of the vaccines and the merits of our vaccination strategy to get to Order, all Australians. Senator Birmingham. Senator O'Neill, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Order. I, can't, I won't be able to hear Senator O'Neill. Senator O'Neill. Will the minister today make a clear public statement that Mr Kelly's advice to the Australian people is irresponsible and dangerous and should not be relied upon? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, I don't think I could have been any clearer in the previous answers about the advice to the Australian Order. people. Rely upon the advice of Professor Kelly. Rely upon the advice of Dr Murphy. Rely upon the advice of your medical practitioners. Rely upon the advice Order. that we promote of the health officials across this country. Rely upon the advice of the medical officers across the states and territories. Rely upon the advice of the Therapeutic Goods Administration. Because you know whose advice our government is relying upon? All of those experts who have kept Australia safe as we have worked hand in glove with them throughout this pandemic. Order. We're not being distracted by other comments. We're not seeking to provoke or promote debates about the order. merits of the vaccine. We are focused Senator on its Wong efficacy and its delivery. Order. Senator Wong. Order on my left. Senator Wong. Point of order, direct relevance. And I would again invite the minister to do the right thing and make a clear public statement that Mr Kelly's advice is irresponsible and dangerous and ought not be relied upon. On the, on the point of order—oh, Senator Abetz, do you wish to rise on the point of order? 
I do, Mr. President. I've been listening very closely to the assertions being made by the opposition, and if I understand the assertion correctly, you don't need no vaccine is in fact a double negative, and therefore, and therefore, Mr. Kelly is in fact promoting vaccine. Senator, and, uh, I don't know why uh, the opposition order. has got any difficulty order. with the matter. You had a very good grammar teacher, Senator Abetz. <laughs> Congratulations. Um, can I? Uh, I'm willing to, Senator O'Neill. I've taken Senator Wong on the point of order. Um, Senator Wong, I've allowed you to restate the question. I believe you're asking me to instruct the minister the terms in which to answer. I believe he's being directly relevant, including just then when um, he was he was outlining he was outlining a series of authorities that I believe um, are directly relevant to the question asked. Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, unlike those opposite, I'm not going to promote debates from anybody who might undermine the vaccine strategy or its Order. distribution. We are going to promote Order. we are going to promote receipt of the Order. vaccine. We are Order. going to promote Senator the efficacy Wong. and safety Order. of the vaccine and that's Time going to be the, the focus of this expired. Senator Wong interjections are always disorderly. Order. Order. I'll call the next question when I have the opportunity to hear it. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I am delighted to ask the Minister for International Development and the Pacific, Senator Seselja, his first question as a minister of our government. Can the minister advise the Senate on how the Morrison government Order. is supporting— Order on my left. It's really disrespectful when you— Order. No, first question. Order. First question. It is not only dis Very Order. disrespectful. All right, Senator Henderson, this is not your, a reflection on you, but please, I'll ask you to start the question again Thank when you. there's silence. On my left, it's not only disrespectful, which it is, it's also completely contrary to the standing orders, and we're only an hour into our first question time. Senator Henderson. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister advise the Senate on how the Morrison government is supporting our Pacific family in the face of the current global pandemic? The Minister for International Development and the Pacific, Senator Seselja. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Henderson for her question. Firstly, I want to recognise the honour I've been given and to reiterate that there's never been a more important time for Australia to stand shoulder to shoulder with our partners across the Pacific. Now, the impact of the global pandemic on the economies of our Pacific neighbours has been profound uh, and the risk to their health systems is acute. The pivot of Australia's development program in response to COVID-19 has been unprecedented. The government's Partnerships for Recovery strategy provides the whole of government framework for our response. It is tightly focused on health security, stability and economic recovery in the Pacific, Timor-Leste and Southeast Asia. Now, Australia's 2021 ODA budget is fully aligned with the strategy, with an estimated $1.44 billion for the Pacific, a record high. The government is also providing $304.7 million for a Pacific COVID-19 economic response package. Now, this targeted temporary funding for two years is in addition to Australia's $4 billion ODA program and delivers critical financing to mitigate fiscal crises, maintain essential health services, sustain aviation connectivity and protect the most vulnerable. We have restarted Pacific worker employment programs to boost economic activity and incomes for Pacific families and Aussie farmers. These programs not only provide work for our, for our neighbours but support Aussie businesses who face their own losses if we do not act. The Pacific Step Up means working with our Pacific partners to build a region that is secure strategically, stable economically and sovereign politically. Together, these programs show Australia's support for the Pacific as the leading contributor of aid in the region, but also as a neighbour, a partner and a friend in these difficult times. Yeah. Senator Henderson, a supplementary question. Can the minister provide an update on the progress of Australia's provision of vaccines to the Pacific and Southeast Asia? Senator Seselja. Uh, thank you. Uh, there is no 
higher priority for countries in our region than access to COVID-19 vaccines. Now, Senator Payne and I have already reached out to our counterparts in the Pacific and Southeast Asia to underline our commitment and advance the next steps on vaccine rollouts, uh, including $523.2 million over three years for a COVID-19 vaccine access and health security initiative for the Pacific and Southeast Asia. $80 million previously committed to the multilateral COVAX facilities advanced market commitment to support vaccination for the populations at greatest risk in 92 developing countries. Now, this initiative offers full vaccine coverage for the Pacific and Timor-Leste and will enable the procurement of vaccines and provide technical support to pre prepare for vaccine introduction. We're working closely with New Zealand, France and the United States to ensure our Pacific family have vaccines that are safe effective and can be accessed to support the Order, economic Senator recovery Selger. of the region. Senator Henderson, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister also provide an update on the support provided by Australia to our Pacific neighbours after Cyclone Yasa? Senator Seselja. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And first, I acknowledge uh, the dreadful loss of life and devastating property damage in Fiji, the conditions they now face again, uh, unfortunately, with Cyclone Anna. Uh, but we have stepped up uh, with $4.5 million in humanitarian relief. At Fiji's request, uh, a, a RAF aircraft conducted aerial damage assessments to aid relief planning. HMAS Adelaide was deployed to support relief efforts, including construction and engineering to repair over 30 schools. In total, we delivered over 165 tonnes of supplies and almost 1 million litres of water. Now, I had the opportunity to speak to Prime Minister Frank Bainimarama, who thanked his Australian Vivale and noted again Australia's willingness to help Fiji in their hour of need. I reminded the Prime Minister that 12 months earlier it was Fiji who helped us with our bushfire recovery. It's a great example of how people and nations across the Pacific can help each other, and we will continue to support our Fijian Vivale in their recovery. Order. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Mm -hmm. Senator Rice. Hi, I ask the, min the minister representing the Prime Minister for an explanation as to why an answer has not been provided to question on notice ni number 1905 relating to community sport infrastructure grants. Okay. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Senator Dave, Birmingham. Th th thanks, Mr. President. I understand a response uh, has uh, has recently been tabled, Senator Rice, but uh, I am. Happy to uh, to also lay a, lay a copy on the table uh, for the Senate Chamber, and I'll walk one over to you in a second. Uh, that yeah. So no. The, now, once it's been tabled, that brings a close to that matter, so it can't be followed up in the chamber. Are there any motions to take note of answers, Senator McAllister? Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answer given by Senator Birmingham to the question asked by Senator O'Neill. Now there are room, there is room for many different voices on different issues in a mature democracy. And we can find room to disagree about policy priorities and we can find room to, uh, to disagree about facts and about values. But there are some lines some lines that should not be crossed. And one of those lines is endangering lives. Over the past year, the member for Hughes has crossed that line again and again and again. He has made demonstrably fa false claims that endanger ordinary people's health. His comments are now notorious arguing against all available scientific evidence that particular drugs can cure COVID when they cannot, and claiming, as he did just this month, that mask wearing is dangerous and forcing children to wear them is child abuse. Yes. Peddling false medical information at any time is dangerous. Doing so during a global pandemic that has claimed 2.2 million lives worldwide is inexcusable. And yet excuses is exactly what is being offered 
from the top down, from the Prime Minister, from the Deputy Prime Minister and today in this chamber by the Leader of the Government. These excuses don't hold up. They don't stand ordinary scrutiny. Asked if Mr Kelly's remarks would cause panic and fear in the community, Mr McCormack lamely said he did not think so. Offering this excuse, I don't know how many followers Craig Kelly has on his Facebook or a social media platform, but it's probably poor compared to perhaps what the mainstream media has. Well, Mr Kelly proudly boasts that his posts reached over 1.8 million people in January and, I uh, quote, ensured that more people are exposed to the facts and have been educated about Invermectin and OCQ and zinc. Now, the Prime Minister has refused to condemn Mr Kelly's comments, saying glibly that Mr Kelly is not my doctor. Well, an actual doctor, the vice president of the AMA, said that misinformation like the, that, was, that was being shared by Mr Kelly was torching the foundation of community health and science. But the Prime Minister said he thought Mr Kelly was doing a good job as the member for Hughes. Well, what does that look like? What is this good job that the Prime Minister is talking about? Mr Kelly's Facebook page is a relentless cavalcade of misleading information. Since January 30, he has published 23 posts. 12 of them promote COVID misinformation, nine provoke climate misinformation, and one relates to a community event, just one. And he topped off that performance by doing a 90-minute podcast with Mr Pete Evans, a man who last year was fined by the Therapeutic Goods Association for make Authority for making false claims about supposed COVID fighting devices, and went on to tweet a meme containing neo-Nazi imagery. It should be easy. It should be easy for the Prime Minister for Mr McCormack and for Senator Birmingham to condemn a man who has peddled dangerous conspiracies. And it should be even easier to condemn the use of taxpayer-funded platforms to spread them. Mr Kelly is afforded a privileged position. He is a pre-selected member of the Liberal Party. He is a member of the Australian Parliament. And I don't think it should be beyond Mr Morrison to say very clearly what is clear to everybody else in this community that what Mr Kelly is saying is wrong and it is dangerous and that people should not listen to him in particular. A real leader, a real leader with a spine would find it within himself to have an opinion, to express an opinion about the wrong and dangerous ideas espoused by Mr Kelly. And the failure to do so is even more extraordinary when we consider the relationship between Mr Morrison and Mr Kelly, because it has been widely reported that Mr Kelly owes his job, owes his pre-selection to Mr Morrison. Mr Morrison intervenes to save Maverick MP Craig Kelly from pre-selection defeat, the Herald in 2018. Scott Morrison's fixer offered Craig Kelly's challenger a $350,000 party job to drop out. Well, Mr Kelly has his seat in this parliament, thanks to Mr Morrison. And the least Mr Morrison can do is show some courage, show some courage and hold him to account. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Senator Carr. Scar, sorry. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. Uh, I too believe, as the Prime Minister believes, that Senator, uh, Craig Kelly does a wonderful job for the people of Hughes. And I want to say, I want to, say to Senator McAllister, and all those opposite who are seeking to attack Mr Craig Kelly or anyone else or anyone else in this country as we go through this process of encouraging, encouraging Australians to receive uh, medical advice from their trusted source and to make their own decision to vaccinate on the basis of that expert medical advice. I say to those opposite that the way to approach this debate is not to demonise is not to antagonise, is not to insult. It is to have a respectful discussion and seek to persuade people's minds. That is the way to deal with the issue, Senator O'Neill. I've actually read quite widely some of the literature that has been published over many years with respect to the way, the best way, the most effective way to deal with those people in our community, including those overseas, who are resistant to vaccinations. And the lessons I took from reading that scientific literature in many cases is that the worst thing you can do, 
the worst thing you can do is exactly what the opposition sought to do here today, and that is to attack and vilify people as opposed to engaging in a mutual, mutually respectful discussion and encourage people, encourage people, encourage you're not at ALP pre-selection for the Senate ticket today, Senator O'Neill, so please don't interject on me. It is Order. not the way, it is Order. not the way to boost the maximum participation in relation to this vaccination rollout. It is simply not the way. And I'm quite happy to circulate some of the articles I've read that which consider research over many years in relation to the best way to encourage people to vaccinate. I will be taking the best medical advice that I can find, and that includes my own local GP, Dr Ben Gordon. And I give you a shout out, Ben. You've been a loyal servant to my medical health over many years. And I'll be sitting down with my GP and having the conversation which thousands of Australians will be having or should be having with their medical professional. And I am entirely confident that just as the case with respect to the high vaccination rates that our children have, with respect to many vaccines that have been lifesavers, absolute lifesavers for millions and millions of people around the world, I'm confident that after those conversations take place between individual Australians and families with their medical professionals, their medical advisers, that the majority of Australians will decide will make their own free voluntary decision to be vaccinated. It does not help. It does not help Senator O'Neill to seek to vilify and tip a bucket on people who have a different view to you. The, the result of it is, the result of it is, Order. and there is scientific literature to this extent, the result of it is people simply seek to confirm their own prejudices and bunker down. That's the result of it. That's not my, that's not my theory. That's the theory that has been written in scientific literature again and again. You must have a mutual, respectful debate and emphasise the positive aspects, the positive aspects of people obtaining a vaccination, not just for them, but also for their family and for the broader Australian community. So I do say, Madam Deputy President, that those opposites should reflect, should reflect on the carping negative approach to this topic which they brought into this chamber today, because I don't think it's constructive. And I think you will achieve exactly the opposite of what you're seeking to achieve. And you know what? You know what? One of the big issues is so many Australians have a lack of confidence in so many government institutions across the board, across the board. And the best way, the best way we can encourage those Australians to be vaccinated is to encourage them to have discussions with their own medical professionals, with their doctors, with nurses, with pharmacists, obtain the best advice that's available to them and make the decision that's in the best interest of themselves and of their family. And I think once they have those discussions, once they receive that comfort, then I'm very confident that Australia will have an extremely successful vaccination rollout program, as we've had with respect to a number of vaccines over decades and decades. Thank you, Senator Scar. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, uh, um, Madam Deputy President. I, I cannot believe that we're actually this year still talking about Conspiracy Craig, the um, member for Hughes, Mr Kelly, who's a fringe crank who isn't fit to sit in the other place. He's a danger to public discourse, he's a danger to public health, and he's a danger to public institutions. This is an MP who is so hated by his own Liberal branches uh, and that in the last two elections the leader of the Liberal Party has intervened to save his pre-selection from them. Now, just think about that. Scott Morrison could not be moved to stop the, pre the deselection of the father of the House and former Defence Minister Kevin Andrews, but the Prime Minister saw fit to intervene to stop Kelly's rightful removal by his own branches. By his action, his selective action, Mr Morrison deems cons conspiracy Craig worth, worth more worthy of saving than a 30-year veteran in this place. Mr Hughes and those who excuse him those who support him, those who lack the integrity to call out his dangerous deceptions and are a constant embarrassment to this parliament. And sadly, 
Prime Minister Morrison is one of those who continues to excuse Mr Kelly's behaviour. And we saw the same acceptance of Mr Kelly's comments by Senator Birmingham, the Leader of the Senate. Let's look at some of the statements from Mr Kelly that uh, he's put out. Uh, he went on a, a state-sponsored trip to Azerbaijan and declared that Australia had a lot to learn from their electoral system, despite the corrupt Azerbaijanian government releasing the election results two hours before the polls closed. That's how much of a sense of democracy Mr Kelly has. Business Insider reported that when Craig Kelly emailed the Therapeutic Goods Authority at the height of the pandemic last year about the efficacy and safety of experimental COVID-19 cures, um, and when told that they didn't work, he instead perpetuated the lie that they did. He cannot accept the fact from health professionals. He cannot accept the truth. He cannot accept the public health advice of his own prime minister. Yet the prime minister gives him enough rope to go out and do whatever he's doing out there. Mr Kelly said that the Australian medical officials, who everyone seems to be hiding behind, had committed crimes against humanity. That is the man that you are supporting in your contributions today. Conspiracy crackpot Craig, the member for Hughes, who ignores all evidence, all credible, widely critiqued and supported evidence. He constantly de de denies the scientific consensus around climate change. He openly spreads lies and mistruths about the attacks on the US Capitol. And he promoted baseless allegations about voter fraud in the wake of the 2020 US presidential election. He's unfit to serve in this place, but he has the Prime Minister's confidence. He has the Prime Minister's cover. He has the Prime Minister's complicity in this conspiracy against Australian people. And he has the, the Prime Minister allowing taxpayers' funds to enable him to broadcast misinformation of the kind that he was reported as saying, you don't need no vaccine. I now hear that in addition to these egregious examples of a failure of leadership by a man who sits in the Australian parliament, he went on a podcast of Pete Evans for 90 minutes. Well, and, and you know what a, what a great conspiracy theorist leader he is. Kicked off Facebook for repeatedly spreading dangerous COVID-19 misinformation. He lost several commercial deals because people in business will do what this government won't do. They're actually calling fakers out. They're calling liars out. They're calling deceivers out. This government is incapable of acknowledging the deception that lies within their own party. Mr Evans is a gleeful proponent of ludicrous conspiracy theories about QAnon, Pizzagate, both of whom which have inspired violent insurrections and armed attacks. That is the danger of following the, the path of this government. Across the globe, we're facing a global pandemic that's claimed over two million lives. Every day that Mr. Mor Mr. Morrison allows Mr. Uh, the member for Hughes to tweet out, to put his messages out on Facebook, impacts 1.8 million Australians. We cannot afford this. Every single member of the parliament, especially the Prime Minister, needs to speak with a uni united voice on the medical evidence to ensure Australians get appropriate treatment. Truth matters. The truth matters and lies promoted at the highest levels by popular influences, which I'm ashamed to say, Mr. Kelly Thank is, you, have real and material impact on our health. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Deputy President. Australia has been through uh, an incredible 12 months uh, dealing with the COVID pandemic. Uh, we know that lives, sadly, have been lost far too soon, uh, and we know that many jobs have suffered. We're certainly on the road to recovery and recent, uh, recent announcements about the, the surge in, in new jobs, particularly in full-time jobs, is, uh, is really, really good news. Uh, in my home state of Western Australia right now, uh, we're experiencing it. Uh, and it's, a, it's an occurrence that uh, in Western Australia, we're actually not that familiar with because we've had uh, 10 months of uh, no community transmission and just having spent some time in the regions uh, on holidays with my family. Uh, it's, been a, it's been an experience that uh, we have cherished and we're all West Australians have cherished. But right now, uh, 
West Australians uh, are doing the right thing. Uh, they're staying home as they've been asked to do. Uh, they're getting tested. Uh, the Premier, as uh, I stand here right now, is, is giving a, an update on uh, where things are at. And thankfully, now, uh, after the second uh, day after the announcement, uh, we still have zero cases uh, of community transmission. And West Australians are going to get tested, which is also very good. But this sort of scenario uh, is with us and, continue, and uh, may continue to be with us where there will be the, the occasional outbreak because we are, of course, seeing as many uh, Australians return home as we possibly can uh, so that they can get back with their loved ones, so that they can maybe attend funerals and, or, or, or deal with uh, family members that are sick that are trying to return or they've, they were unable to leave early in the pandemic and, but they've now uh, freed themselves up to be able to come home and we're, you know, we're going to continue to see many, many new arrivals. Uh, so we, we continue to run the risk like what we're seeing in Western Australia right now. And the, really the only way that we'll get to a point where we don't have the risk and we don't have the massive interruption uh, to businesses, to livelihoods, uh, is, is to, of course, see the vaccine rolled out. Now, our Therapeutic Goods Administration is arguably one of the best in the world. And Australians can have tremendous amount of confidence in the Therapeutic Goods Administration and knowing that they are, have gone through a very rigorous process, a very careful process to ensure that the vaccines that uh, Australia has uh, acquired and, and now approved is, is going to be rolled out in a safe way. Uh, they have approached this uh, with real determination, but they haven't been hasty either. They've been methodical and they have applied themselves to ensure, through an independent process that's independent of government, to ensure that this vaccine and the, and the various uh, uh, items that we will be uh, dealing with across the country uh, are safe and are able to have the impact that we need. Because like uh, many people across about 80 per cent of our population in Western Australia, we don't want to have to go through lockdowns. I think of the small businesses that are being impacted right now. I think of those cafes that are having to throw out uh, huge amounts of uh, produce, fresh produce that they've purchased in advance, believing they're going to be trading over the next few days. And they're having to throw that stuff out. I think of the workers that right now are having to stay at home and aren't able to earn a living for their families. Now, the Australian government is there for those people, providing all sorts of support for those people. But clearly the vaccine, the vaccine is going to be the way for us to deal with this. Now, Labor on the other side say that they support this, but by raising such ridiculous notions, ridiculous questions and highlighting you know, fringe little issues is not doing anything, not doing anything to support uh, Australians and building confidence in the vaccine program so that it can actually help us deal with it. Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. I'm waiting. Senator, uh, I believe there's still one opposition, but unless you've done some swap. <laughs> Is it you, Senator Sheldon? Yes, thank you. Uh, well, first of all, we're living in an age of misinformation. In the middle of the global health pandemic, when listening to expert health advice has been never so important. We have crowds of people online spewing rumours, conspiracy theories, undermining experts and telling people to ignore health experts. <laughs> and it's no wonder that the government has its work cut out. For when it comes to fighting this virus and getting the country back to where it was, it takes a team effort, everybody's effort, and an obligation of that team. It's even more ridiculous that members of their own party are out there spreading misinformation, online undermining their own efforts to fight the virus. Of course, 
What does the member of Hugh Hughes had to say? You know, talking about the Therapeutic Goods Administration, you know, the regulatory agency for the Australian government, as part of the Department of Health, he says, the day of reckoning is coming for the TGA. They've, he said, committed crimes against humanity. They're asleep at the wheel. This is what an elected member of parliament has said about the independent expert led body, the TGA. The body that advises and provides expert advice. How much harder is it getting out of this pandemic going to be when members of the parliament are undermining the TGA and members of this government? The Prime Minister has had no problem in the past intervening on caucus members, but he certainly has a problem with Craig Kelly intervening. No problem cutting off Minister Rustin when she was speaking at a press conference, but when it comes to cutting off the member for Hughes, what does he say? He's not my doctor. Well, you're right, Prime Minister, but he is a member of your government. This is the same sort of lame, blame, shifting response we have come to expect from the Prime Minister. When half the country was on fire and he was nowhere to be seen, he told us he didn't hold a hose. When a member of his government is undermining the vaccine or telling people not to wear masks, he reminds us that the member for Hughes isn't his doctor. You can't just imagine it now. In a few months, when we're in the middle of a vaccine rollout, undermining every step of the way by the crazies of the Liberal Party backbench, the Prime Minister's team falling apart, what will the Prime Minister's response be? I don't give the shots. Apparently, the only time the Prime Minister is responsible for anything is when there's a chance for him to do a press conference or a photo shoot, shoot, uh, shot or do a marketing pitch. What else did the Prime Minister have to say about the member for Hughes? You get it from the official government websites, and that's what I encourage anybody to do. And that's what we're doing, and that's what we're, in, we're investing in. Don't go to Facebook to find out about the vaccine. Just go to official government websites. Well, Prime Minister, there are 25 million Australian Facebook users. Craig Kelly says he's reached to over a million people on Facebook. It's increasingly the source of becoming the source of news, including how to deal with the vaccine and the COVID-19 pandemic. Australians should be encouraged to listen to experts, and the job of spreading the advice of experts, both in traditional media and social media, is harder when members of this part, very parliament are spreading misinformation online. Leadership is all about choices, often tough choices. Expect in this case, leadership is about the easy choice, the obvious choice. It would cost the Prime Minister nothing to tell Craig Kelly to deactivate his account. It would do the country a world of good for the foundation this for the, to take on this misinformation and to shut it off completely. It would make the government's life easier. When it comes to fighting the virus or rolling out the vaccine to stop the member for Hughes' Facebook page from spreading conspiracy theories. Instead, the Prime Minister is failing the test of leadership by not making the tough decision, the right decision, the right choice in favour of national health and our communities. The choice to stand beside and even endorse the member for Hughes is endorsing candidates you agree with. That's what the Prime Minister has sent a mixed message to the entire public. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Your time has expired, and I do remind you to refer to members by their correct title. Uh, so the question is that the motion is moved by Senator McAllister be to take note, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. And I believe Senator Lambie's and Senator Waters are splitting time. Senator Lambie. Uh, thank you, um, Deputy Madam President. The start of the 2020 financial year was 19 months ago in July to— just, Senator Lambert, sorry. just remind you to in, indicate who you're taking note of. Who, oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, just take note of, my, take note of uh, Senator Birmingham's uh, answers. To your question? To my question. Thank, thank you. you. 
The start of the 2020 financial year was 19 months ago in July 2019. Our country has changed a lot since then. We had a once-in-a-century health crisis. We've struggled through brutal economic shockwaves. We've seen the government shovel incredible amounts of money out the door just to try and keep businesses afloat and industries alive. Sometimes the government has made choices that benefited some businesses more than others, and that's natural. Sometimes in a crisis you've got to make difficult choices to make sure you can get through it. What worries me, though, is through all that time the coalition has been taking donations from businesses that might have benefited from those choices they've made. But we don't hear anything about that money until after the decisions are over. Yesterday we found out that the coalition got $69 million in donations and other receipts since July 2019. Businesses owned by Mr Anthony Pratt gave them more than $1.5 million. Some mystery organisation called the Greenfields Foundation gave at least $450,000. Now, I'll tell you what, that's not a foundation. It is just a political... Is it, just a, it is a political donation that is usually just given in a brown paper bag, and that's all that is. And the ANZ has donated over 100,000. This is the thing. Donors do not give money out, to, out of the goodness of their hearts. They're giving it because they want a chance to bend a minister's ear about what they need to get through the tough times and that what we've had since COVID has hit our shores. They're looking for a chance to make their case, and they're getting levels of access that most small businesses can only dream of. It's no wonder that a person who used to be in charge of policing our political donation laws has come out and said they're one of the worst in the world. It's about time the major parties did the right thing and tidied this thing up for the good of the country. Oh, the question is the most is, is it the same the same. Senator Waters. Thanks, President. I rise to continue to take note of the answer given to Senator Lambie's questions on, on donations. Uh, yesterday was the one day of the year when we find out who's paying who, and what it tells us is democracy is still for sale. And in fact, the amount of donations that were given in the 2016 election compared to the 2019 election, there's three times as much money that's getting paid to political parties. Uh, the problem is getting worse, not better, and this government is still doing absolutely nothing to fix it. Um, donors aren't just donating for the sake of it because you know, they're altruistic. They're donating to get favours. They're donating to buy outcomes. That is what the Australian public think. That's why perceptions of integrity of government are at all-time lows. Um, we had to wait 19 months to find out about those donations. It should be real-time disclosure. Um, we don't find out about all of them because the disclosure threshold is so high. It's $14,000 and it goes up by a little bit each year. Well, there's one third of the amounts of money that are being donated to the big political parties that we'll never know where the source comes from, precisely because that threshold for disclosure is so high. We think the threshold for disclosure should be much, much lower at $1,000 so people know who's paying who, so they can see what outcomes are being bought and ideally stop the rot. Um, what we saw this morning was some, finally um, some hope for the broader reforms that the Greens have been pushing for for years. We think big money should not influence politics. We think it should not be buying outcomes. And we like to see uh, bans on donations from certain industries that have a track record of trying to buy outcomes, like the mining industry, the banking sector, uh, the gambling sector. Um, but ideally, we think that donations, no matter where they're coming from, should be tiny. And we want to set a cap on donations of $1,000 per year. It doesn't matter who you are, whether you're a big corporate, a union, a grouping, an individual. No one should be able to buy influence. Democracy shouldn't be for sale. Um, and we were pleased to see uh, some members of the opposition express some support for the notion of a cap on donations. We know that um, other folk on the crossbench have also pushed for that. And in fact, there's a number of private members' bills before this uh, parliament that would cap uh, donations and would lower that disclosure threshold. I am hopeful that we might see some action. I'll be speaking with uh, other members in this chamber to try to deliver donations reform because the members of the Australian uh, country want their democracy back. They want to know that the folk in here are representing their best interests, not the best interests of whoever just took them out for a lobster lunch or whoever just paid a massive amount of money to buy a government contract. That's the other thing that needs fixing. If you're applying for an environmental approval or a government tender, you should not be allowed to bribe your way into that outcome. You should not be allowed to donate while your application is on foot or six months on either side of it. There are so many ways we could clean up 
our system, there are so many opportunities for reform to restore confidence in democracy and this political system, and the Greens look forward to continuing that work and finally um, delivering Order. democracy Senator back Waters, to the, the people. The question is the motion made by Senator Lambie be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it.